But what is the idea? In all the hoo-ha, in all the sort of confusion about, you know, the controversy about the idea, people seem to have forgotten what Hardy was actually proposing. And this passage uh, that he wrote in New Scientist a couple of weeks after the talk basically sums it up. And he's, he's basically saying that humans moved to the coasts and started foraging in the shallows, wading, swimming, diving for shellfish and other foods like that for several hours at a stretch. Now, that is not a mermaid. That, that people have got this idea exaggerated in their heads that, that an aquatic ape is, you know, really an, an aquatic in the true sense of the word. But Hardy never uh, referred to that, and neither did Elaine Morgan, who's written books, six books on the subject subsequently. So, let's just talk a little bit more detail now about the sort of things that people like me consider uh, are evidence for a more aquatic past uh, uh, for, he for humans compared to chimpanzees. Basically, the point is that of the three species, humans, chimpanzees and gorillas, we are actually genetically closer to chimpanzees than they are to gorillas. It's a, it's a surprising fact, but the DNA evidence and the molecular studies really make that quite clear. So humans are closer to chimps than chimps are to gorillas. And yet, anyone can tell, it's not just because we're looking at it through our eyes, that humans are the odd one out of the three. Um, we are very different from the other apes. Uh, and it's those differences that if you're a Darwinist, you try to come up with a plausible scenario which might explain them. And that's really where this aquatic ape hypothesis comes in, because I think it explains those differences far better than any from the mainstream orthodox paradigm, which is basically still savannah. So, for instance, humans can swim. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because I want to keep the, short, uh, the talk r relatively short. But um, each of these, I think, can be explained and, uh, and, and, and not proven, but uh, argued from a very, you know, that prob pr from a probabilistic point of view that it's very likely to be true. So basically, humans are relatively good swimmers uh, compared to the rest of the apes. Nobody would claim that we're, you know, good swimmers compared to aquatic mammals. And even compared to a lot of terrestrial mammals, we're not particularly good. But we're certainly by far the best swimmers and divers amongst the apes. Human babies are fat. Uh, the last trimester uh, in pregnancy, the baby is, is putting on uh, uh, layers of fat. Now, this really just doesn't make sense if our ancestors were roaming the savannah plains or climbing trees. The only place it really makes sense is if uh, infants were you know, exposed to a risk of drowning, uh, so that the, the increased adiposity, the increased buoyancy would enable the mother to rescue the baby quickly, and also obviously for thermoregulation. Now, uh, there are three big trends in human evolution that uh, uh, we all know about. I mean, the first one is the large brain. Human brain size and cephalization has, is one of the major phenomena on human evolution. And everyone knows that the brain takes up a lot of energy and it requires a, a rich food source to fuel it. Even when you're just sitting down and doing nothing, your brain is using up a lot of energy. So uh, in, uh, people have, all, have, have long postulated that our ancestors started uh, adopting a different food supply. And if you're thinking of the savannah, the, the only food supply that is possible really is meat. Uh, smashing up bones, scooping out the bone marrow, eating brains of, of carcasses, and obviously eating meat. But there's a problem with this because at the same time that we, our brains have got bigger, our teeth have got smaller. Now, we must be the first carnivore or uh, species that has become more carnivorous to have at the same time reduced our dentition. And when you sort of pose this little dilemma to people, they say, ah, oh, well, there, there must be cultural aspects because our ancestors also started using technology. Maybe they started cooking the meat. Maybe they started using stone tools to cut it up. And clearly, stone tool use is a big part of human evolution too. There's no doubt about it, although the timing uh, seems to be a little bit problematic. But if we're thinking of these three trends, the encephalization, dental reduction and increased tool use, I think there's a far, far more parsimonious explanation for the three together than this savannah idea. And that is on the coasts, as Hardy suggested. Here we have 
an infinite number of pebbles and little rocks that you can use uh, as a stone tool. So the idea would have been pretty obvious to any early hominid. You have lots of these sessile foods that are just there. A three-year-old could take a pebble, crack the uh, shell, scoop out an oyster, uh, and have a nutritious meal that would be very good for the brain. We know that these foods are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, people like Steve Cunane and Michael Crawford have done lots of studies on this. Uh, things like iodine is very uh, high in the marine food chain and we know that cretinism is a problem which causes brain size to be reduced. Um, so it seems to me that this is a far more plausible uh, model for those three things happening in human evolution. Um, there are other weird things as well. We've got all these kind of breathing control differences. I mean, my nose, like most noses, is like a beak. It's pointing down. The nostrils are inferiorly orientated and it kind of makes sense in a swimming ha uh, environment. Uh, and yet, despite our noses kind of beginning bigger and a bit more protruding, our olfaction is definitely reduced. So compared to uh, all of the other uh, primates and specifically chimpanzees, our olfaction is actually worse, which doesn't really make sense for a species that's supposed to have come down from the trees and wandered out onto the savanna and become a scavenger and a hunter. The other thing is about speech itself. I mean, if you had to say, well, what's the main difference between apes and humans, the most significant difference, I think most people would agree it's syntactical speech. As I ramble on and talk to you and the sound goes into my camera and then later, hopefully, from your PC into your ears, um, our brains have got this amazing uh, system inside there which parses out the sounds and dissects them and makes sense out of them. Now, how did that happen? Now, the, the studies have rec recent, that have recently been done with uh, bonobos like Kanzi and other chimpanzees and bonobos have shown them to be amazingly uh, uh, adept at learning symbolic language. Uh, as long as it's sort of pictorial uh, and uh, you know, physical, uh, but what, what they can't be taught is to even say the word banana. It seems to me that voluntary breath control is the really key factor that they're missing. So again, this makes perfect sense in a waterside environment. Okay, now, obviously there's a lot more that I could have talked about for these uh, bits of evidence, but let's just stop it there.